Good morning. Welcome to the our worship service for the third Sunday of Lent in 2021. Hard to believe that it's already March 7th. Um, for many communities, uh, including New Hope, one year ago tomorrow, March 8th, was the last normal Sunday together. For Pownal, we made it one more week before the shutdown. This is what I wrote to the Facebook page on uh, the Pownal UMC Facebook page on March 17th of 2020. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Pownal United Methodist Church has made the unfortunate but responsible choice to suspend worship and all church-related activities for, at a minimum, <laughs> the next two weeks. We hope to resume normal church activities on April 5th. Please stay tuned as the crisis continues to unfold. Two weeks. Not so much. Turns out it's been a lot longer than two weeks, and we've all experienced so much in the past year that sometimes it's hard to, to keep our heads on straight with everything that we've gone through and that the world's gone through with all that our communities, our friends, our families, our neighbors, our world has experienced over the last year. But we're coming to a point now where the winter seems to be drawing to a close. I don't know if you noticed, but next week we're supposed to have a couple of days in the 60s, at least the low 60s. And we're starting to think, I'm starting to think, I hope you're all starting to think of what it might look like for us to be able to worship together responsibly in the spring and maybe even in the early summer. And one of the things that I would like us to be able to do is gather in some way, whether it's drive-in worship or outdoor worship or something like that. Um, and so uh, the times that we've tried to do that, we've had some interesting technology snafus. Today, I'm trying something completely different. This, I hope, looks almost the same to you as what you're normally seeing, but all of the back uh, underlying technology here is different. And one other thing that's different about this is this whole thing is live today. I'm, I'm doing this live. The sermon's going to be live. I'm talking to you live from our worship room in my house. Everything is live. And what I'm hoping is that it works. Because if it works, it opens the door to us um, having a lot more vibrant worship experiences as the weather warms up. Um, the side effect of that is that I'm not really going to be able to see much about what's going on in the chat window. Although, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at my phone um, because the chat window is open there. So when we do prayer requests, you can go ahead and do them and I will try to catch them um, in the chat window as we... So we continue on anyway. So I hope this works this morning. Um, it may, it may not. We'll, we'll see. Uh, either way, it's, it's uh, the first step toward um, finding a way to be together live in a way that we haven't been in a while. And regardless of whether it works, you're welcome here. You're, you're just welcome here. You're welcome here if you're having a good morning or if you'd rather still be asleep. You're welcome if you're in your Sunday best or if you're still in your pajamas or somewhere in between. You're welcome if you're a committed Christian, if you're just trying to wrap your mind around all of this. You're welcome if you're single or married or divorced. You're welcome if you're male or female, cis or trans, binary, non-binary, gay, straight, bi, questioning. You're simply welcome. You're welcome here in the completeness of who you are right now. God's child invited into relationship with God, by God, and loved completely for who you are at this moment in time, who you have been in the past, and who you will yet become. You are welcome, and you are loved. Um, I do have a few announcements this morning. Uh, the first is that Wednesday, uh, we will continue our Lenten series, for, uh, The Walk by Adam Hamilton, session three at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, this one is serve here i am lord send me it's about service obviously and if you are participating please read chapter three for wednesday also we're continuing oh and thank you so much to all of the people who came and participated in moving the things we need from uh, from 550 west main street to 182 yesterday it went smoothly it happened relatively quickly um, a bunch of people participated, and thank you all so much for being willing to participate in that effort. The cleaning out of 550 continues this week. On Tuesday from 6 to 8, and um, Wednesday from 7 to 9, 550 West Main Street will be open for all of us, for all of this community. Um, you can come, and, and anything that's left in there that isn't that doesn't have to stay, like you can't touch the microwave, but or the refrigerator or the appliances, but um, all of the other stuff. There's some dressers, some some minor furniture, some bed frames, uh, 
there are a bunch of things in the building and uh, anybody from this community who wants any of it can come and, and pick through what's left on uh, Tuesday from 6 to 8 and Wednesday from 7 to 9 and uh, just, you know, come and take it. Um, if those times don't work, give me a call. We can try to work something else out. Um, and then on Saturday, uh, we're going to post to some of the community sites like Berkshire Helping Hands and um, whatever other sites you can make known to me that the entire community, anybody who wants to, is welcome to come and take from that building whatever they would like um, in an effort to both bless our community with some of the things that we don't need that they might and in an effort also to clean the building out in preparation for its final sale. So um, that is uh, Tuesday and Wednesday and then again on Saturday for the whole community. Um, also, uh, I just want to remind you that we do have a social media presence. Our website is at https colon forward slash forward slash new dash hope or you can scan the QR code on your screen. Uh, we have a Facebook page and a YouTube page. And if you like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll increase our visibility in the community and help us to extend our reach as we spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So that's all I've got for announcements for us this morning. So let's be together, uh, apart together in the spirit of prayer and celebration and worship as we do the call to worship together. Weary and overwhelmed, we gather. God's holy word revives us. Simple and confused, we yield. God's word gives us wisdom. Blind and uncomprehending, we await. God's word enlightens our eyes. More precious than gold is God's word. Sweeter than honey are God's commands. Let's pray together. O oh God, your weakness is mightier than human strength. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. We rejoice that you are with us today. Open our hearts and discipline our will. Teach us to follow your perfect ways. Test us with your righteous decrees. As with a whip, drive us from unholy living and turn, turn us toward your holy light. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, comfort and redeem us with your holy gospel. Amen. And now, let's sing together.
sent Jesus Christ to us. And Jesus came and gave us peace and freedom and filled us with love and grace. And we respond with grateful thanksgiving most of the time. Sometimes we are not quite as successful in giving our gratitude to the one who gave everything for us. But that's just part of what it means to be human. We are not created to be perfect. We're created so that we have the ability to strive for more. And part of that is giving ourselves to God, confessing the way that we have fallen short and allowing God to recognize and forgive us again. Let's bring our confessions before God. With hearts of sorrow, we come before you, O God, to confess what you already know. We have failed to keep your laws. Again and again, we have followed our own selfish will, rather than the holy and life-giving will for our lives. We have twisted your decrees and institutions to suit our preconceptions and interests rather than your own. Forgive us, O God, and cleanse us from hidden faults, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God shows steadfast love and blesses to the thousandth generation those who walk with God. In love, God sent Jesus to bless and redeem God's people. God forgives us our sins and restores us to new life. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice in God's mercy. gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of John chapter 2 verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. Thanks be to God. I am going to tell you what, for me, is a fairly traumatic story. I had just gotten my driver's permit. When, when I was writing this, I couldn't remember whether you could get your permit at uh, 15 and a half years or at 16 years old in Pennsylvania. So I looked up driving ages on the internet. And first, let me say that, wow, you really can't get your license in New Jersey until you're 17? That would have made my last two years of high school unbearable. Anyway, so I guess you can get your uh, permit at 16 in Pennsylvania and your license at 16 and six months. And this happened right after I got my permit. So it was right after I turned 16. In fact, this happened the very first time I was on the road. My dad was determined that I should learn how to drive on a standard transmission. And it seemed reasonable to me. Uh, you know, I would played all these video games that all had stick shifts. And so I pretty much thought I was good to go. 
So we went out to some office park or uh, something like that on a Sunday afternoon when it was empty, and he put me behind the wheel. And I, I caught on right away. At least I caught on to the use of the clutch. I was fine starting on a hill going up or down, and in Pittsburgh, that's a necessary skill when you're driving anything. But that uh, old Renault Encore, I, I, I can't exactly remember what it was, but there was something weird about the shift pattern on that Renault. I might be misremembering, but like maybe the basic shift pattern was inversed. You know, instead of reverse being up and you know to the left or all the way to the right and down, um, reverse was where first gear usually lived, and first gear was back toward the driver, and then second was toward the windshield, and third was back toward the driver, something like that. Whatever it was, it was strange. It, it wasn't like any video game I'd ever played. Once while we were driving, I, I got wigged out and I downshifted from fifth to second, and it was eh, kind of a jolt. But we were in a parking lot, and I have to stress this, I'd never driven, not anything. We, we weren't farmers, there was no farm equipment that I was driving when I was a kid. We didn't have a riding mower, I'd never driven anything except a video game. But that first time out was fun, at least for a while. But then it was time to go home, and, and Paul, my stepfather Paul, not my kid Paul, but my stepfather said, okay, now just uh, go up to the edge of the parking lot and turn out onto the street. Really? I, uh, I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> I'm not ready to be driving out on the street yet. This is my first time behind the wheel of anything. I'm really not ready for the do it, but just do it. Okay, so I did it. And yeah, it wasn't that bad. I didn't stall even once. I never ground the gears. I was feeling pretty good. So I started the drive back to our house and I was doing just fine. And okay, up here on the, on the right, get on the highway. <laughs> that is where the fine ended. I really, really didn't want to get on the highway. I wanted that to be lesson two. <laughs> But he insisted, and so dutiful son that I was, I got on the highway and immediately, immediately lost my cool. It was like I forgot how the shift lever even worked. This vague sense of panic rose up, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and there was a car cruising up behind us. Even in the slow lane, it was gaining fast, and Paul told me to shift in the fifth, but all I could see was this grill in my rearview mirror getting bigger and bigger and bigger way too fast. And he's yelling at me, shift now, shift now! Even in the heat of the moment, I remember some voice in the back of my head saying, I told you I didn't want to do this. But then I shifted out of fourth and into third. <laughs> and the engine screamed. And the car behind us was way too close and reacted poorly to our sudden, you know, brake light free deceleration and swerved recklessly into the fast lane while both honking and giving me the famous single finger wave. And I overreacted the other way, and our little Renault went up, uh, shooting across the shoulder, across a little ditch, up the steep hillside on the far side of the ditch. At that point, I was all instinct. I felt my hands uh, shifting and my feet working the clutch and the brakes, and the car went up the hill. It tipped a little bit on two wheels, and then I downshifted and gunned the little car back down the hill across the rough side of the to the road where we did a 180 and stopped facing the wrong way on the highway just off the shoulder. We got out of the car, and Paul, who was furious, furious, lit up a cigarette and started to pace around a little bit. As it turns out, I was furious, too. I mean, I didn't want to be on the highway in the first place, and I had told him that in no uncertain terms. I told him I wasn't comfortable with the shift pattern, and he'd seen that in my previous bad shift. So we kind of wandered away from each other and said nothing for a few minutes until the flashing lights came up behind our car, actually in front of our car, since it was facing the wrong way. A state cop pulled up and got out and asked if we were okay. And Paul told him what happened and the officer said, well, I don't think much of how you got up the hill, but getting down again without flipping the car was pretty impressive. And that was about the best thing that happened to me that day. He also said that since uh, he called in the accident, he had to make a report. He also said that since I was on a driving permit, an accident like this would likely make me ineligible to get my license until I was I don't know, maybe 17 or 18, I forget. And remember, I said that would have made my last two years of high school just dreadful. And so Paul didn't skip a beat. He said, actually, I was mistaken. I was the one driving. And the officer said, are you sure? Yep, I was behind the wheel. So they gave each other an appraising look and nodded and 
shook hands and he said, have a nice day and got back in his car and drove away. And we got back in our car and turned it around and drove home in silence <laughs> with him behind the wheel. <laughs> oh, we were both so angry. But as angry as he was, he still took responsibility for the driving. He didn't want that one mistake to cost me a couple of years of driving. Angry as he was, he was still looking out for my best interests. And I gave him credit for that. I mean, I gave him less credit when he spent the next 20 years telling the story at family gatherings, conveniently leaving out the part where I told him several times that what he was asking me to do was a bad idea. But it was still a pretty impressive thing. In that state of anger, with the adrenaline still pumping, that he was willing, that he was able to cover for me, to look out for me, to protect me and my interests. Now, that's not usually... Uh, the kind of story that comes up here in this scripture when we're talking about Jesus flipping over tables, when we're reading about the Savior, the Prince of Peace, making a whip of cords and driving out with a whip, with a whip. I mean, think about it. Flipping over tables is one thing, sure, it makes a point. But you know the money changers are going to collect their spilled belongings and walk out, probably muttering, but not hurt. A whip is a different matter. And, and so we can argue about who got the focus of the whip. In the New Revised Standard Version, the one we read this morning, it says, In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. So he found the people, he drove them all out, but then it says both the sheep and the cattle, and so it's unclear, did he drive the people out with a whip, or just the cattle and the sheep, or all of them? The Common English Bible removes a little bit of the ambiguity when it says he made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. So yeah, the Common English Bible is telling us that Jesus chased the people, the cattle, and the sheep. Again, remember, with a whip. Even our old friend King Jimmy says, And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen. The message, uh, the paraphrase of the Bible by Eugene Peterson, maybe makes the most colorful rendition when it says, Jesus put together a, a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple, stampeding the cattle and the sheep. I'm not sure why the NRSV seems to gentle Jesus here. Maybe it's just the way it's phrased, but it seems like the NRSV might be uncomfortable with this image of Jesus rampaging through the temple with a whip chasing out people along with cattle and sheep. And I gotta tell you, I'm not entirely comfortable with it either, to be honest. I mean, Jesus is love incarnate, right? Love came down at Christmas. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Right? Where's the love in a whip? But of course, that's the wrong question. The love isn't in the whip. The love is in the accountability. Jesus had a thing about accountability. He knew how hard it is for us to be self-policing, that there are too many demands on our time and our focus. He knew how easy it is for us to be led astray. I mean, it's part of human nature. It's who we are. It's who we were built to be, with natures that tend to have vulnerabilities to distractions of the world so that we can rise above those natures to something that gives glory to God. We are created less than perfect so that we can strive towards perfection, as John Wesley would say, or that so that we can strive to be perfect, therefore, as our parent in heaven is perfect, in the words of Christ himself in Matthew's gospel. We are created, not broken, I'm not going to say that we're fundamentally broken at the moment of creation, but we are created with a tendency towards moving away from God's desires for us, with a tendency toward what we call sin, what the scriptures call hemartia, missing the mark, shooting wide of God's desires for us. We are created with this tendency towards sin, and we're given the free will to choose a more perfect way of life in Christ, what John Wesley would call the more excellent way. This is from John Wesley's Sermon 89 called The More Excellent Way. Who then is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him resolve this day, this hour, this moment, the Lord assisting him to choose in all the preceding particulars the more excellent way. And let him steadily keep it, both with regard to sleep, prayer, work, food, conversation, and diversions, and particularly with regard to the employment of that important talent, money. Let your heart answer to the call of God from this moment, God being my helper, I will lay up 
no more treasure upon earth. This one thing I will do. I will lay up treasure in heaven. I will render unto God the things that are God's. I will give him all my goods and all my heart. We have the choice to choose to be better, to live in the more excellent way, to follow Christ, or to choose to follow the things of this world. Wealth, money, pain, fame, power, glory. We have the choice. And so did those people in the temple. They had a choice. Every year, all of the Jewish people had to make a pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem the heart of Jerusalem, and they believed literally the home of God. They had to go there and make sacrifice to God. For those who lived in Jerusalem, maybe the trip was easy. You know, they just bring one of the animals that they'd raised on their uh, farm or whatever, the sacrificial animals that cross the street to the temple and take care of business. But for others, it was harder. Imagine, for example, that you were a poor carpenter in the backwater town of Nazareth. The trip to the temple, I mean, assuming you were on your own and not bringing, say, a family with you, or maybe a few families, or maybe a whole caravan of families, mostly on foot. If you were alone, you might be able to walk those 93 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem in, what, four or five days? Maybe more if you had to keep track of children, or if your co-travelers experienced, I don't know, injuries, leg cramps, whatever. Maybe a lot more. If you had to bring, say, for example, a couple of sacrificial bulls on the trip. What if you were, say, a poor fisherman in the town of Capernaum? I don't know. We'll just pull a name out of the air. air. Let's call him Peter. Your walk is a lot longer. Maybe 120 miles. So what's that? Six days a week? Wait, you're still dragging those bulls around? Maybe several of them? Maybe more than one family? Maybe a few sacrificial sheep that need to be herded along the way? So a week and a half? Two weeks? Longer? This pilgrimage was no simple thing. And the merchants in the temple were there ostensibly to make it easier. They were there to sell the sacrificial animals to the pilgrims. Maybe a poor merchant in Jerusalem who didn't own animals would need to buy one. Or maybe a shepherd whose flock didn't have animals of sufficient purity to be sacrificial animals. No worries, you can buy one at the temple. Have to travel 100 miles to get to the temple? Eh, don't bother bringing an animal to sacrifice. Just get one at the drive through window. I mean, it sounds like they were there to help people, but they weren't, and they were there to make a profit. That's okay, right? I mean, they deserve to make a little profit, don't they? Well, the problem is they weren't making just a little profit. They were users. They knew that everyone who showed up had to make a sacrifice, and they also knew that many of those who came didn't have an animal and would have to buy one, and they could charge pretty much whatever they wanted. So they took advantage of their own people, gouging them, charging way too much, knowing that they had no choice but to pony up. And that really made Jesus angry. Listen to this version of the story, but from Matthew's gospel. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be a, called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers robbers, thieves. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't want you to miss how significant this is. The word thieves or robbers here in Greek is the same word that Matthew uses to describe the thieves who were crucified next to Jesus. When Jesus said, you are making my father's house a den of robbers, he was saying that those people were guilty of the same crime that put those other two men on crosses next to Jesus. That's not trivial. I don't think Jesus had a problem with people making an honest profit. I mean, they raised the animals, they put work into the animals, they deserved something for their labor. But I think the usury made him furious. And so he made a whip and he chased them out. The people, the sheep, the cattle. It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He chased the people who were selling both the sheep and the cattle. And yeah, okay, that's traumatic and maybe a little unexpectedly aggressive, but it didn't really cost them anything, did it? I mean, he chased them out, but I'm sure the money changers righted their tables and collected their coins. And the cattle and the sheep, even if they evaded their owners a little bit as they were headed out of the temple, I mean, they were branded. Their ownership was clear and legal. They may have been humiliated, those people, and they may have had their profits cut, you know, by a little for however long Jesus was at the temple, but they didn't really lose anything. They recovered their coins and their sheep and their cattle. But wait a minute, there was something else too, right? 
The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves. And doves. Well, rock doves. Yeah, pigeons, technically. The sacrificial bird. The three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell the story with fewer words than John does. They give some variation of he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. Mark mentions the pigeons, but in passing. You know, it overturned, he overturned the chairs of the bird sellers. In John, something else entirely happens. And I think it's something that underscores the earlier point. Jesus may have chased them out, yes, but did it really cost them that much? I mean, listen again. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. He drove out the people, the cattle, and the sheep. But he knew they'd get their stock back. They were branded. They were, probably didn't get far out of their owner's sight anyway. He overturned the money changers' temples. Yeah, but right there, probably they maybe lost a few coins when they rolled across the temple floor. But people feared and revered the money changers. And I bet you they got back almost everything of what Jesus spilled. But the birds. It's not like they were GPS tracked. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing no one put a lot of time into training pigeons raised to be sacrifices to be homing pigeons. If Jesus opened their cages, if Jesus chased them out of the temple, they were gone for good. And the people who raised them, the people who came to sell them, they'd be out a lot of money. But here, even in his anger, even in his fury at what was being done to God's people by God's people, right there in God's holy temple, even as angry as he was, Jesus didn't want to cost them, to bankrupt them. Guilty as they were and angry as he was, Jesus was still looking out for them. Like a father who told the cops that it was him behind the wheel, so I wouldn't have to wait two more years to get my license. He drove out the people selling the cattle and the sheep, and he overturned the money changers' temples. But the money wasn't going to get that far, and believe me, they were watching where it spilled. But those birds, once they were gone... They would have been gone. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Jesus was angry, yes. But even his anger was a tool not for condemnation, but for correction, for accountability. And even in his anger, his anger never overcame the power of his love. And friends, that is such a good thing for you and for me. Because I know I do things that Jesus would hold me accountable for. Of course I do. Of course I do. You do too. If Jesus were here among us today, every day, he would flip over our proverbial tab tables and chase out our proverbial cattle. I mean, we're not selling sacrificial animals at usurious prices, of course, but we do turn a blind eye to suffering. We do seek to promote ourselves rather than lifting up our sisters and brothers. We do focus too much time and effort and energy, and sure, I'll say it, idolatry on the things of this world instead of keeping our hearts and minds focused on where they should be, on Jesus and on God and on each other. And it's got to make him angry, furious. But as angry as he might be, his anger will never take precedence over his love. His correction will never overstretch his compassion. And we don't, we don't need to look any further than this table right here. Because on the very night that Jesus gave himself up for us, after he told his closest followers that he was about to be betrayed to the death, they asked him, who, Lord, who, who, who is going to betray you, Lord? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. This meal of compassion, of forgiveness, of grace that we celebrate, this meal in which Jesus is made manifest in our midst, in our lives, present to us and present for us. The very night that Jesus introduced this table of grace to a world in dire need of grace, the first person who ate the bread is the one who betrayed him, fed to him by the hand of the one he betrayed. Yes, we might turn away from Jesus with our worldly obsessions and our petty betrayals, but, in, but the hand of the one who fed even Judas Iscariot will never turn us away. No matter what we've done, no matter how far we've strayed, we are forgiven and we are loved. And Jesus, who loves us, has always got our backs. And it's more than a father claiming to have been in the driver's seat to save his son's chances to drive. 
It's a savior claiming the cross to save us from our own wayward ways and to give us the choice and the chance to participate along with our savior in God's continuing revelation. Jesus has always got us and holds us and never lets us go. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for reminding us that anger isn't always wrong, but even outrage must come from a place of love. Help us to be people who find ways to express your love and care for your children, even as we struggle against injustice. Help us be more like the one in whose name we pray, Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We worship a God of abundance, a God who didn't even shy away from the cross and gave us this table of grace. We worship a God of abundance from whose hands flow all the blessings of our lives. May we be spared the misguided use of these blessings simply for our own pleasure and purposes. Give us right and generous hearts, God, that your blessings may flow from our hands and to those in need. If you would like to share the blessings God has given you with our community and with the community that we serve, you can send an offering to P.O. Box 744, North Adams, Massachusetts, 01247. Or you can go to https colon forward slash forward slash new dash hopeumc.org and use the give online link for secure donations to our giving partner. We're going to have our, our beautiful anthem, uh, wonderful blessing of an anthem played by Robin again this morning uh, in a moment. Um, while we're doing that, I will do my best to keep track of any prayer requests that come through the chat window, although my phone screen is rather smaller than the one I'm used to looking at. Um, also, we're going to have communion, so if you haven't gathered elements, feel free to go and gather communion elements as you're blessed by this music.
pray together. The wisdom of the world tells us to hoard what we own, O God, while you invite us to share what we have with those in need. Accept these gifts for your purposes, that we may be your servants in the world. Amen. We do have a few prayer requests uh, this morning. Um, we want to offer prayers of healing, continued prayers of healing for Ashley's mother and for Donna's neighbor, Anne, and for John Neville. We'd also like to offer healing prayers for uh, Val's brother, Jeff, in Connecticut. May God, the great physician, be with them, give them strength and healing, and remind them that they can always rely on the strength and power of God. And while we continue to offer uh, healing prayers for Carl's Aunt Sally, we also would like to offer this morning prayers of celebration, that she uh, continues to recover, and that she's moved out of the post-surgical rehab facility and into her own apartment. So we celebrate her continued recovery, even as we pray that God be with her and continue to walk with her down the path to wellness. All this we pray to God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also uh, pray for the uh, availability of vaccine appointments. Um, it's so hard. People are having such a hard time getting vaccine appointments. We just ask uh, for God's grace to grease the wheels and make it easier to get those appointments and get more people vaccinated as we look forward to a time when we can find what the new normal is and return to life in some semblance of what we'd experienced. These are our prayers and we have other prayers that we've got in our hearts uh, and we just lift them all up to God. Let's pray together. God of incredible grace and mercy, God of healing, God of blessing, God of providence, God who provides and sustains. We come to you this morning with our hearts full of doubt and yet full of hope. As we leave the deep freeze and look forward to the spring coming and thawing out the world, we ask that you thaw out all of our hearts, that we might find a way to live in community together, regardless of where we are on the spectrum. Fill us with love for one another, a love that is rooted in your love for us, and remind us that we are created all to be your children, and to live with and support and love and walk with and stand with and stand for one another. For those who are in the front line still against this pandemic that's been going strong in this country for a year now, we ask you to give them further strength, to keep them well, to shield them with your powerful hand. For those who are on the front lines of keeping us safe, protecting our communities, helping to save us from disasters and keep us well, we ask that you give them courage to face anything that might come their way and remind them that they never face it alone. For those who are sick, we ask for healing. For those who are addicted, we ask for freedom. For those who just don't know what comes next, we ask for your light to guide them along the road that leads to you, to love and compassion and joy and a fulfillment of life. All of these things, Lord, and those that we have not said aloud or typed or emailed, all of these things, we lift up to you this morning, spoken and unspoken alike, knowing that you hear both kinds of prayers, all kinds of prayers, all prayers, you hear them. We lift them up to you and lay them at your feet and ask for your blessings in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And blessing given to us by God, the love of God that comes to each one of us through Jesus Christ. This love is made manifest for us in this table where we can come together and share the bread and the cup, reminders of the grace of God and the sacrifice of Christ and the love that Christ bears for each one of us that was enough to bring him even to the cross and through the power of God to the empty tomb. All are invited to this table, this virtual table. Everyone's invited. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are. It doesn't matter where you are on your Christian journey or if you're not even on your Christian journey yet. It doesn't matter. You're welcome at this table. It's not my table. It's not New Hope United Methodist Church's table. It's not the United Methodist Church's table. It's the table of Christ. And Christ invites everyone into that meal, even 
Judas Iscariot, who he gave the bread after he had dipped it on the night in which he was betrayed. All that matters is that you, right here and right now, earnestly desire to set aside those things that separate us and live together in love and in the grace of God and Jesus Christ. You're welcome at this table. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and shared it out among his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, shared it out among his disciples, gave thanks to you, shared it among his disciples, saying, Take and drink ye every one of this. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time that you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so... In remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered wherever we may be and on these gifts of bread and vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, through your, uh, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, our honor and glory is yours, God Almighty, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf in many places, we who partake of this loaf together are one. The bread that we enjoy in God's name is the bread of life. And the cup over which we give thanks, this cup that we share, is the cup of blessing of Christ. The table is set. Let all who wish to dine come forward and feast from the meal of grace. The bread of life broken for you and the cup of salvation poured out for you. Thanks be to God. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. 
Grant that we might go into the world in the strength of your Holy Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We proclaim the crucified and risen Christ, who is the power and the wisdom of God. May Christ strengthen us and give us wisdom. Go forth then in the name of Christ. Amen.